welcome to our first evening webinar for our open week on what does it mean to teach Christianly. My name is Daisy and I'm the Student Sur Services Supervisor here at the College. Tonight in this education focused webinar, we'll be hearing from Jackie Stock, Education facilitator, uh, facilitator and Lecturer here at Easton. Jackie clearly has a love for learning with qualifications in science, engineering, education and theology. She has 16 years experience teaching and leading in schools, as well as postgraduate teaching in the National Institute for Christian Education. She has a keen interest in exploring how Christian educators can be faithful in the task of teaching. Jackie will be sharing with us for about 45 minutes, uh, followed by a time for questions. So please use the Q&A box on your screen to ask any questions you might have. Please also note that this session is being recorded. So if you know of someone who may want to watch or you can't stay for the whole thing, our recordings will be available at a later date. So please uh, fill in the connect form on the website to get those uh, links to the recordings. It's now my pleasure to hand over to Jackie. Well, thank you, Daisy, for that very warm welcome. And uh, let me echo Daisy's welcome to all of you to this webinar where we're going to explore in a little bit more detail what it means to teach Christianly. And I've been a little bit provocative in using that title because I know some people don't like the, uh, the phrase teaching Christianly, but it's asked a lot. It's a question that I've been asked many, many times in my, in my time as a teacher. And I think what it's essentially, what we're essentially asking when we ask that is how do we connect our Christian faith with our calling? Um, with our vocation as a teacher? Or how are we living out and teaching kingdom values so that we can point our students to the kingdom of God? So there's this real heart in the question about being Christ's ambassadors, being Christ's uh, hands and feet in the classroom. So the, the Christian school teachers I talk to and all teachers that I talk to who are Christians, there's that real sense of purpose and mission in, in being a teacher. Uh, I've been asked many times in my uh, 16 years of teaching that I should, I've been told many times that I should consider full-time ministry and, and my response has always been the same. I already am in, in full-time ministry. So tonight I'm going to draw pretty heavily from my own experience uh, in teaching and, and that quest to discover what it means to teach Christianly. And for my friends who are from state schools or are thinking about going in st into state schools, there's still quite a lot that I will talk about that I think is transferable. And I, I look forward to hearing about how you're connected, uh, some of what I might have said with, where, with your mission in state schools. Now, if I can remember back to when I started out, I, I think I had a pretty simplistic view about what teaching Christianly meant. I thought, it meant telling students about Jesus and loving them as Jesus would. And that's pretty good. But after uh, six years, the first six years of teaching in Christian schools, I was actually quite lucky. I was in a Christian school where uh, they were keen to explore what it means to teach Christianly. And they put time and money and resources into training teachers to teach um, from a Christian perspective. And that was, teaching from a Christian perspective was the end thing. That was the biggest response to how to teach Christianly at that time. So we went to conferences, we had workshops, and Christian perspectives was, was usually the topic. But, and this wasn't just the focus of the, um, in Victoria, this was across the world. Christian perspectives was the most common approach to teaching Christianly at that time. And after six years, I thought that was the, the way of doing it. I thought if you had asked me, what does it mean to teach Christianly? I would have said that you are teaching from a Christian perspective. And then in 2010, it's a bit of an odd story in how I got there, but I went to Grand Rapids, Michigan to do a workshop with a man named uh, David Smith. Now, if any of you are in Christian education and you've been to conferences, 
in the last 10 years, there's a high chance that David Smith was one of the keynote speakers. He's an excellent leader and speaker in Christian education. But I had never heard of him in 2010. When I traipsed over to Grand Rapids, I just went on a whim, really. I could afford it. I was single. I had money. And I flew over there because I liked the idea of spending a week with um, David Smith, whoever he was at the time, and the other 19 people in the workshop in exploring uh, Christian education. And this particular week had a pretty long lasting impact on me. So I'm going to share my screen now. So at the start of the workshop, uh, David asked us, what is the hinge between Christian and teaching? What is that thing that connects Christian and teaching? What is it? Now, you of course know that I thought I knew the answer. I thought that Christian teaching from a Christian perspective is what, what it was that actually joined the two. So he started off by asking us, is it the fact that the teacher is a Christian? Is that, is that what connects it? And of course, I thought the answer was no, no, that's not it. And he said, actually, that's really important. It's actually a, a key part of the picture, but it's not the whole picture. And then he went on and he said, is it the Bible? Is it the fact that we use the Bible in the classroom? Is that the connection between Christian and teaching? And I was thinking, you know what? I've been taught about using the Bible trivially or proof texting, and I knew that that wasn't the hinge, so no. At this point, it was a bit like uh, Spot the Dog books. I don't know if you've read Spot the Dog books, but you know, it was like he was asking, is Spot under the stairs? And I was like, no, no. Is he in the basket? No. Is it the Bible in the classroom? No, no. And I knew where Spot was. And of course, the next question that, that David asked was, oh, he said, the Bible's important. If we use the Bible genuinely in the classroom, it is actually important, but it's not the whole picture. And then he went on to, well, is it Christian perspectives? Now, if I was brave and not cowardly, I probably would have jumped up and said, yes, that's it. Because that is what I had basically concluded was the link between Christian and teaching. And then he said, it's important, but it's not the whole picture. And it completely rocked my world because I thought that's what that's what we were on, all on about. And then he brought in a fourth hinge, um, which he was talking about Christian practices and formation. So Spot wasn't under the rug after all. Um, <laughs> he, was a, he was in all those places really. So the main point, and it, and it might seem simple to you, but at the time for me, it was pretty revolutionary that there's this beautiful multifaceted nature of Christian teaching. Uh, that we get to explore and we get to explore with the help of the spirit what it means to be Christ's ambassadors in our classroom. So what I'm going to do for this webinar is I'm going to look at three of those hinges. I'm actually going to talk about Christian perspectives because while it might not be the hinge, it's actually important and I want to explore a little bit about why they spent so much time talking about that and why they still do to an extent. I'm then going to talk about formation, Christian formation and practices. And then I'm going to finish with the Christian teacher, the first hinge, because that is really critical. And the more I teach, the more that my own spiritual formation, I've come to realise that my own spiritual formation is so important in the, the link between Christian and teaching. So let me start with Christian perspectives. So, as I noted before, this was uh, a very common approach across the world, and to an extent still is. And this approach recognises that over time, with the Enlightenment, with uh, the rise of scientific, the scientific method, with modernity, we've come to a place where we think we have no, no we don't have need anymore for God to explain things. Friedrich Nietzsche said, God is dead. And that's what he was effectively saying. Man's reason or human's reasoning skills, we don't, they're fine. We can explain things through science, all of that. 
uh, is explainable now. And so back in those days, if you were a scientist and a theologian, that was normal. But since the Enlightenment, since the rise of the scientific method, nowadays, if you say you're a scientist, people look at you and go, well, how does that even work? How can you possibly be a scientist and a Christian at the same time? So what's happened is we've, we've split the world into the sacred and the secular. And if you think about the sacred, you've got the church, uh, missionaries, religion, priests and nuns, the Bible. And when you think about Christian schools, or yep, Christian schools, you've got chapel devotions, your religious education classes, and your mission trips. So they're, they're, the, they're the sacred, the holy things, if you like. And then you've got the secular things, which is basically uh, everything else in the world, the money, government, innovation, and then all those rest of those subjects at school. So you've got your sport, science, health, maths. And then you've got this really uh, interesting thing happening with, with the arts where we like to split it into the Christian art and music and secular art and music. And what's really interesting when you start to look at this is this is not, this is not the way God designed things. He did not design the world for us to split it up into the sacred and the secular. And in Colossians 1, Paul says, For in Christ all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And a Christian educator rewrote that and, and, and said, God is God of heaven and earth, the creatures of the sea and the deeps, of solar systems and scorpions, of rainforests and radiation. He is the God of spelling lists and quadratic equations, of novel studies and basketball drills. I really like that. Now, if you want to read more about the history of the divide between sacred and the secular, and also those people that stood up against it, then one person I would recommend you get to know a bit better, he's no longer alive, so you can't get to know him in person, um, is Abraham Kuyper. So he was a Dutch theologian, uh, journalist, politician, and he was even the um, prime minister of the Netherlands in the early 1900s for a time. But he really wanted to stand up against um, this idea that man's reason or human's reason stood above um, God's sovereignty. And he wanted to get across the idea that God was sovereign over all. And he is famous for saying, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. It's a great quote. And I've heard it many times in my, my time as a teacher. It reminds us that everything that we teach, every element of school is under the sovereignty of, of Christ. So when we talk about Christian perspectives uh, or biblical worldview is sometimes another way of saying it, we're really asking about the stories or the, the story or the stories that we live out of. What is, what is the grand narrative of our lives? And as Christians, we would say that we live out of the biblical story. Uh, it's the story of the good news of Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection and his reign. And we read the entire Bible narrative in light of Christ. So one of the ways that Christian schools uh, apply and universities apply these ideas to teaching is by looking at a topic or a unit within the biblical framework of creation, <coughs> excuse me, fall and redemption. And so the creation, fall and redemption um, framework is actually a tool. It's, sim it's a simple tool. Uh, it doesn't cover all elements of the Bible, but it provides us with a useful uh, starting point. Now, an excellent book, and it's very short, and I'd highly recommend it, is a book by Roshan Orpress and Andrew Shami called The Insect and the Buffalo. And what they do is they look at the, the uh, framework of creation for redemption and how it um, is weaved throughout scriptures and how it's still important for us today. Excuse me while I take a drink. <clears throat> and they have this absolutely gorgeous introduction which I'll read out to you. Pachelbel's Canon in D 
is one of the most beautiful pieces of music ever written. The entire piece is built upon a structure of eight notes repeating on the bass line. These eight notes carry the music from start to end, providing a foundation for the melodies that carry over the top, which are themselves developments of the same thing. Throughout the canon, even though the melodies become increasingly complex, the same eight notes can be heard over and over again, providing a unity to the music, holding it all together, so that we are always aware that this is one composition by a single composer with a broad, simple and elegant vision. And if we were all together in a room, I'd play it, play it for you. It's a bit tricky over a webinar. <clears throat> Oh, I could sing it to you, but I won't because nobody wants that. But I encourage you to uh, listen to it after this webinar. Look it up if it's not already playing in your head. They go on to write, the Bible is a little like Puckabell's canon, in D. Although its storylines, characters and scenes are wide ranging and diverse, a simple theme echoes throughout. God creates, humanity rebels, God redeems his people. Creation fall and redemption. So let's start looking at creation. <clears throat> so when we think of God's good creation, we generally think about the natural world and the universe, the stunning scenes of nature. If you saw the pictures behind me before, uh, if you stand on the top of the Swiss peaks, they're from Switzerland, you cannot help but just be amazed at God's creativity and design and, and praise him. But God's good creation includes not only the earth and its creatures, but also cultural gifts such as marriage and family and art and language and commerce and even government when things are working well. Back to Orcrest and Shami. We understand that the world and humanity were created good. We perceive the breathtaking order and diversity of the cosmos. See beautiful works of architecture, hear the miraculous sounds of music, and witness men and women from all cultures engaged in acts of courage, love, and intelligence. God's good creation is tangible and it's everywhere around us. And that artwork that I've got there is from my sister. An example of, of a woman reflecting the creativity of her creator. So as a teacher, when we are planning a unit, we can ask, well, what was God's creative intention for this area? What have men and women done in this space to reflect God's good creation? So for example, excuse me, if we were doing a unit on nutrition, that would be a great unit to sit and marvel at our creator God. <laughs> Not only is our body designed to take in all these nutrients and minerals and carbohydrates and whatever to, to make to you know to allow us to flourish, but all those all those minerals and whatnot are found in the food that is provided in creation. So there's just this beautiful harmony between the two. So that's one example where we can just immediately see God's um, good creation. No human designed that. Uh, but when it comes to a unit, say, on transport, well, God didn't create cars in the creation week. And that's when we look at the innovation and the creativity of humanity in the way that we reflect our creator. We are images of God. We image him. And, and we know he's an amazing designer because we just have to look at an eagle in flight. And we can see the engineering that it takes for an eagle to, to stay up there. And we reflect, we show glimpses of that that creativity and design when we um, create sh uh, shuttles that go up to space or planes that take off or really heavy ships that don't sink. So that's an example of how we reflect our creator. And then we come to the fall. <clears throat> so this is where we start asking about the worldview stories that are competing with God's story. So these are the stories that tell us to look after number one first, the stories that tell us to accumulate wealth, consumerism, the stories that tell us to fight for political power at the expense of lives and livelihoods, the stories that tell us that one race is a priority over another. <clears throat> so
So if we go back to shaming and oppressed. Yet we are part of a story where human rebellion has shattered the peace of this world. The same people who are capable of such good have unfathomable capacity to do all kinds of evil. Human leadership on earth has rippled out of Eden, Babel and Egypt to cause all kinds of injustice, cruelty and disappointment as human empire succeeds human empire. We are not surprised to find misery and death in the world because we understand that the fundamental problem is not the unequal division of resources, lack of education, intolerance, or the absence of a strong wise leader, but that these are symptoms of the basic problem of sin and death. So going back to our unit on nutrition, and that apple is not meant to reflect, the apple with the ants is not meant to reflect my nutrition unit, but we can see the impacts of greed. We can see the impacts of addiction. We can see the impacts of companies that choose cost-saving uh, measures over you know, healthy things to put in our food or what can be loosely classed as food. If we think about our transport unit, we see the impacts of our desire to have the newest and the latest. And so we buy a new car every few years. We see decisions made by some to use the transport as a weapon. And we can see the, the effect that the emission, emissions have on our planet. Just some, some ideas that spring to mind. Whenever I talk about the fall, I always remind people using this quote of uh, Donovan Graham. It is extremely important to realize <clears throat> that while sin distorted the creation, it did not destroy it or turn it into something evil. Sin neither abolishes nor becomes identified with creation. Sin is of a different order. It lives as a parasite of creation, able to exist only as an agent that twists what is good. So now we head to redemption. So as I read earlier, in Christ all things hold together. He came to redeem all things, to buy back all that was lost. And so now we have an opportunity to be active agents in the redemptive process. And I love this passage from 2 Corinthians 5. Paul writes, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And I love the way that Shambi and Oppress pull out these key ideas of reconciliation and new creation. They write, our task is to participate in the revelation of the new creation. Like Joseph before Pharaoh, Daniel before Nebuchadnezzar, and Paul in the Roman Empire, we operate inside this fallen human world in order to bring about small, incomplete glimpses of the world to come. We subvert empires from within. We are engaged in translation from God's future world to this world that is fallen but being redeemed. We live out of his story, and this story, the story of the Bible, changes everything. So coming back to our nutrition unit one more time, we can, we can take up the challenge uh, with companies that use fertilizers and pesticides that contaminate streams and rivers. We can take up the challenge to be more fair in our food distribution, uh, to make sure that food is not wasted. Um, we can work together in better eating habits. We can take care of the body that God's given us. And when it comes to new modes of transport, well, we can use these reflections of our creator, this innovation and design to think about creating um, vehicles that minimize emissions. We can think about whether our travel is necessary and reduce our, our travel miles. <clears throat> 
So when we talk about Christian perspectives, we are talking about placing all areas of our curriculum and our schools under the sovereignty of God and the redemption through Christ. It is, it is God, it is the story of the Bible and that changes everything. So let's move to our, so you can see why that was important and why they spent so much time on it. I've only given a very small glimpse of, of what they talked about, obviously. We're going to move on now to the next hinge, uh, the, which was really the focus of that week that I spent with David and the others in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And that is the idea of formation and Christian practices. So this idea has been around for a long time, but it was really the work of James Smith in 2009 in a pretty landmark book that, that brought this idea back into focus. So in 2009, James Smith wrote Desiring the Kingdom, Worship, Worldview and Cultural Formation. And before you go out and buy this book, he followed it up with another book in 2016 called You Are What You Love, The Spiritual Power of Habit. And effectively, both books cover the same ideas, except that You Are What You Love, he was effectively asked to write that for the average, the average reader rather than the academic. But in both of these books, he is really challenging that, that overemphasis on perspectives, on te Christian teaching that focuses on perspectives. He's not saying it's not important, he's just challenging the overemphasis. And what he, what he brings to the table, he says, what if education wasn't first and foremost about what we know, but about what we love? So he wants us to think about education as formation rather than information. And every school and university is in the uh, business of formation. So when you, when you drive past the school and you see that they've got a big banner out the front that says, that celebrates the highest ATAR, that tells you something about what that school values and what kind of student they want to see um, come out at the other end. If you look at the Australian curriculum, you get a sense of what the Australian government wants our students to be. So they use phrases like um, contributing to economic prosperity and social cohesion. So whether it's the government, whether it's our school, whether it's our own classroom, we've all got an idea of how we want to see our students formed. So James Smith echoed uh, philosophers before him like Nicholas Walterstorff in saying that our anthropology influences our pedagogy and that's a real fancy way of saying that the way we see the nature of human beings influences or impacts how we teach our students. <clears throat> so if we are thinking of our students as brains on sticks then we're going to see our teaching role as depositing information into their heads or encouraging them to solve problems using their brain, that all problems can be solved using their brain. And we can see this, this type of education if we look all the way back to people like Plato and Aristotle and the Socratic method. It's, it's throughout history as this approach. And at uni we learnt about this idea in the metaphor of the Nuremberg funnel. <clears throat> I'm not sure if you've heard of this. Um, but the metaphor effectively is what we're talking about. You've got the teacher who is literally pouring the information into the head of the very passive student sitting there on the chair. And I have been reliably informed that the German in the background can be translated to something along the lines of starting ignorant and stupid, now clever like God, it has been achieved, the funnel's power. Very interesting. So the danger um, with us in Christian schools, or as Christian teachers, I should say, is that we can simply think that we are pouring Christian ideas into the heads of our students. So what if, James Smith says, instead of starting from the assumption that human beings are thinking things, we start from the conviction that human beings are first and foremost lovers. What if you are defined not by what you know, but by what you desire? 
what if the center and the seat of the human person is found not in the heady regions of the intellect, but in the gut level regions of the heart? And he goes on in the other book, education is not primarily a heady project concerned with information, rather education is most fundamentally a matter of formation a task of shaping and creating a certain kind of people. What makes them a distinctive kind of people is what they love or desire, what they envision as the good life or the ideal picture of human flourishing. So Smith is challenging us as teachers who are Christians to recognize that we're interested in our students being shaped by God's loves and desires. How can we encourage our students to align their loves and desires with God's? How can we show them a vision of the good life, which is not about likes on Instagram or obsession with appearance or the accumulation of stuff, but is more about loving what God loves, seeking the biblical vision of shalom, that idea, that human, that human flourishing idea where the good life is every human being in the right relationship with God with themselves, with each other, and with the created world. And I know that there's a few Christian educators and, and, and scholars who are really looking at the moment at that concept of human flourishing in the, in the Christian school or in schools in general. And we don't just show them or tell them about what the good life is through ideas and concepts, rather, says Smith, it's through practices and liturgies that shape, mould, and direct and in schools we have loads and loads of daily practices weekly yearly um, and and lit effectively liturgies as, as well and so what we've found and it's been quite lovely to watch over the last uh, five or so years is these ideas of james smith and david smith as well they've, they've got to, they've actually written a book together the two of them they would come from the same um, university as well. But you're seeing that uh, teachers around the world are thinking really deeply about what messages they are sending through their practices and reshaping their practices so they're starting, so students are starting to practice those loves and desires. So I'm going to give you a few examples of how teachers have done this just so you can get a sense of what I'm talking about. So the first one is from a colleague of a friend of mine in Canada. And she was reflecting on her weekly show and tell sessions. And what she discovered was that she had been teaching for, for over 20 years and she had um, students who were children of past students that she had. And she noticed that over time, show and tell had become a Try a thing where they were trying to outdo each other with their latest acquisitions, um, devices, and whatnot. And the students that she had taught, who were now parents, were going out and buying things so that their children could show them at show and tell. So she said, There is a consumerist worldview that has crept into my show and tell classes. And this is not the kind of good life I want to be, I want to be teaching my students. So she initially got rid of the, the tradition, which might seem innocuous. And then she brought it back, but with a focus on, she thought, what if show and tell became more about sharing family stories and ways of helping and supporting others? And so she changed her practice. Um, another example is from David Smith, who used to be uh, I think he still teaches German. I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but he used to be a high school German teacher. He now teaches in higher education. And he was struck by the textbooks that you get, the language textbooks, and the questions within those textbooks. And these questions were around um, going, either going shopping or going traveling and asking for directions. and he said it was all about the individual going out and getting things that they need. He said, what if learning a language was more about learning from the stranger? 
What if instead we learn a language so that we can listen to and serve people from other cultures? What if it was more about loving our neighbours as ourselves? So he completely trans transformed the way he taught German so that within the questions he was asking, within the practices, he was actually teaching them to love their neighbour and they were living that out. Uh, a beautiful example of this happened at the school I taught la at last year where uh, the Indonesian teacher discovered that the, the lady in the coffee cart, the coffee caravan about 100 metres down the road was actually Indonesian. And so the teacher got his year 9, 10 Indonesian class and they walked down to the coffee caravan and they, they got to know this lady and her daughter and they learned about the culture and where they'd come from and about their life story. And they bought some food and coffee to support the business as well. But another example of, a, of practices shaping the hearts of our students. Uh, another example could be debates. I've, I've often had an issue with the way that uh, debates are run in, in schools. We, we have kids that enjoy, students that enjoy um, taking each other down with their skillful rhetoric and their, you know, superior ideas. And what if de debates were an opportunity to learn how to listen carefully to the opinions of others before offering our own and to converse with grace and care? They might need renaming, but it's just another normal practice that we use in schools. What if we could tweak them to, to teach how to, how to show grace to each other and how to listen? And if, and if you have a look at Twitter or Facebook threads, it's, a, it's something we need to learn how to listen and show grace in the way that we disagree with each other. And just one more example is something as simple as when we have homework due. Do we have homework due on Monday mornings or even Sunday evenings if we're working at higher institutions? Or are we having them due earlier in the weekend so that we can encourage Sabbath rest, the practices to Sabbath rest? little things like that. Now I've, I've got up there on the screen the What If Learning website. I would highly encourage you to go and visit that. This is where uh, teachers have put up their examples. So I've just, I just went on there before and they put up their lessons and, and, and how they're trying to incorporate Christian formation practices that we are thinking about aligning our students' loves and desires, what God's loves and desires. So some of the uh, lessons are called things like, what if baking, a baking lesson, taught students about honouring the elderly? What if learning about population migration was about hearing people's stories? What if teaching percentages made students aware of injustice? What if circle time was about peace? What if picking up rubbish connected words and actions. So highly recommend that you have a look at that What If Learning, it's just called whatiflearning.com um, where teachers have tried to put this, these ideas into practice. So that gives you a little bit of a sense of, of Christian formation and practices. Once again, you know, in 10 minutes, I've tried to put a lot of thinking and ideas and you don't obviously don't cover everything. So the last thing I wanna have a look at is um, the Christian teacher. And I'm, a, I'm a little bit ashamed about how quick I was to write that off um, as a possible hinge in David's uh, story at the, start of the, at the start of the talk. But the more and more I've spent, time I've spent as a teacher, the more I've come to the importance of, and I mentioned this before, my own spiritual formation and the impact that that has on my students. Um, in chapter three of the book of James, this is a very famous beginning where he writes, not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. And then he goes on and he talks about how um, the bit, the little bit in the mouth of a horse can, and can change its direction or the rudder on a ship can change its direction. And he goes on and says, likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, 
but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great spark, a forest is set on fire by a small spark. And then he goes on a little bit um, further down. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. So there's actually three key, I, I was reading this again um, a few weeks ago and I was struck by these three, sort of three key mantras that I have as a teacher that all kind of appear within, within these verses. The first one is, in the words of Winston Churchill and Peter Parker, with great power comes great responsibility. We have an enormous privilege and responsibility as teachers, and we should never underestimate it. I'm doing a unit right now on adolescent identity and context with the Eastern students, and it keeps coming back about how important it is that we speak life into the lives of our, our adolescents and our younger ones as well. We have power with our words and with our actions. And we can probably all think of teachers in our lives who have played a role in shaping us. And it may be a teacher who said something derogatory. I had a teacher who said that I could spell the words perfectly, but I couldn't string them together. And I was in year 10 at the time, so it wasn't like I was a little kid. And I obviously have not forgotten that line. Um, my physics and math teachers had a tremendous positive impact on my life. And that was the, as Daisy said, I have an engineering degree and a, and a physics degree, and it's got a lot to do with those two men who had a powerful impact on me in my BCE years. So never, never underestimate your words and the way that you can encourage and um, build up your students, even with a smile. The second thing that, um, that came out of this verse, particularly towards the end, was that idea of abiding in the vine and we produce what we abide in. And John 15 is one of those um, chapters of the Bible that I continually come back to as a teacher. I am the vine, says Jesus, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And what is that fruit? Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And we need those, that fruit in our lives as teachers. And the only way it comes about is by abiding in the vine. You know, in all my own strength, I've never been able to produce that fruit at, at the right times. And it's amazing how when we allow God to work in us, we can see some powerful um, things happen in the lives of our students. And I could tell you story after story. I don't have the time, but it's just a beautiful thing to watch. And the last thing that I think that, that those verses um, touch on is this idea that all of my students are God's image bearers. And we have the privilege of every day of seeing the beauty of Christ in our students. And yes, they are fallen. And yes, they can be annoying. But like all of God's creation, the image is distorted but not destroyed. So one of my favourite things to do as a teacher is to look for the image of God in my students and to celebrate it. They are God's good creation who have been created to love him and to live for him not just when they leave school, but every day of their life. And not long ago, I read of a teacher who said, it changes everything when you view people and your students as God's image bearers. And she's, and she's right, it changes how you deal with classroom discipline, it changes how you make decisions about curriculum, it changes your role. So I'm going to um, finish with a poem written by a um, Christian educator in the States called Dan Behrens and he writes some, some wonderful stuff and I love listening to him talk about our students as image bearers and he wrote this poem called If We Saw God in Each Face 
So I'll read it to you. Do we see God in each face we encounter as we walk through our days? If we saw God in each face, would we take more time to understand the pain we see in the face of another? If we saw God in each face, would we pass by needs so quickly? If we saw God in each face, would we do a better job of listening? If we saw God in each face, would we see past race, age, deformity? If we saw God in each face, would we speak of kids as problems to be managed, as just names and grades? If we saw God in each face, would we verbally shred any student in the faculty lounge? If we saw God in each face, would we accept the bullying of, or destruction of any person? If we saw God in each face, would we find a way to bless those we meet instead of rushing to our next task? If we saw God in each face, would we help them understand who their father is? If we saw God in each face, would we want each one to understand how this world belongs to God? If we saw God in each face, would we desire to help all students understand why they are here on earth? If we saw God in each face, would we desire to help all students identify and use their gifts to worship? If we truly saw image bearers, how would it change us? So how does it change our teaching knowing that our students are image bearers, reflecting the wisdom, creativity, love, and community-minded nature of their maker? How are we showing our students where their learning fits within God's big story? How are we encouraging our students to align their loves and desires with those of their father? How are we ensuring that we, as Christian teachers, are abiding in the vine so the spirit can produce fruit in us that enriches the lives of our students. And the answers to these questions just represent some of the ways we might think about teaching Christianly. Now, before I hand over to Daisy, I just want to mention a few books that are out there in case you want to read some more about any of the things that I touched on. So you'll see the two books from James Smith there, Desiring the Kingdom and You Are What You Love. You'll also see The Insect and the Buffalo. But David Smith has an excellent book out called On Christian Teaching, and you can read more about formation and Christian practices in that one. Cornelius Plantinga has a book called Engaging God's World, A Christian Vision of Faith, Learning and Living, and that goes through the Creation for Redemption framework. Um, specifically related to schools and education. And then Donovan Graham has just this beautiful book um, looking at all different aspects of, of teaching and how we do that as, as, as a Christian. So I would re recommend any of those books, but for now I will hand back to Daisy. Thanks so much, Jackie. And it was really uh, encouraging, I think, for those who are with us who are already teachers so encouraging and inspiring for those who are looking to become uh, teachers in the future as well so thank you so we do have a little bit of time for some questions now so if you do have any questions uh, please put them in the Q&A box below we've got a few questions here uh, but keep them coming so uh, the first one here, uh, so you were talking about the hinges. Uh, are there other hinges you have thought about or that are out there that also connect to this idea of Christian and teaching together? Yeah, and this is one of my favourite things to explore. Um, and I'm going to answer this quick question in a bit of a roundabout way. So if you um, bear with me. <laughs> Um, a few years ago, I did a subject with uh, Melbourne School of Theology, because I'm a student there, uh, here's a plug for them, <laughs> called Patterns of Spiritual Formation. And in that particular subject, uh, we used a book called Streams of Living Water by Richard Foster. And he looked at the different faith traditions that have emerged over the years, how we, how we live out our faith. And there were things like the evangelical tradition, the contemplative tradition, um, incarnational holiness, the social justice. And I remember at the time thinking these traditions actually have, have um, reflections or links with Christian education as well. So there are schools that focus on Christian character, 
as the link. There are schools that focus on social justice or, or acts of service as the link between the two. You've also got schools that are big on the liturgies, like your chapel services and your RE, RE um, subject. And they've all got something beautiful about them, I reckon. But we can also learn from each other. And I think that when those, and, and Foster's point is that when those streams flow back together, there's a richness there. So um, yeah, they're just some of the other ways that, that the hinge, the, the different hinges that there are. Very cool. Uh, and a, a question as well, I um, think something some people may be wondering is about the uh, Christian worldview um, and foundation that the education courses at Eastern are taught from. Uh, and one of the really cool things, especially about our Bachelor of Education, is that there are a number of Christian Foundation core units that actually required as a part of the course. And one of those, it's a little bit like that uh, MST unit you mentioned, it's called Living in Christ. And it's that um, spiritual formation uh, type unit. So even in studying education at Eastern, if you're doing the Bachelor of Education, there are those um, spiritual formation and foundational Bible and theology units that you get to incorporate into your course while also doing a registered course to be registered with the VIT and be a teacher. So, I mean, it's as someone who's not a teacher and not from an education background, I think it's such a wonderful uh, and exciting opportunity um, as well. I'm not sure, Jackie, if you wanted to comment on that as well. Uh, I just um, add to that within the course, the rest of the subjects that we teach, there's also that desire to think about the formational practices and the Christian perspectives, you know, some of the ideas that I talked about tonight, so that it's not just in those, I love that they, I love that the Eastern students do those subjects, um, but it flows through into the other subjects as well, so that it doesn't sit, stand alone in those subjects. Very cool. Uh, and another question we have here, um, kind of keeping on that uh, formational uh, practices, are all those practices formational? Is another question. Uh, this is actually something that I keep coming back to. Um, are, all, are all practices formational? Um, I like to challenge myself with the practice and go, well, is that formational, Jackie? Like, have a think about it, come on. Um, so like taking the role in the class, you know, one of those mundane activities that you do at the start of the class or some teachers do, you know, is that a formational practice? Um, and I think that if you just read out a name and, you know, yep, 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 I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, you, you could be sending the message that you're, you know, you're just another name um, or number in the classroom. You know, perhaps that's an opportunity to, uh, to get to know your students, to, to make them realise that they're important and loved. So I think the answer is yes, but it's just one of those things that I like to continue to um, reflect on. I think the point too is to not um, to not sit there and, and critically analyse everything that you do and get anxious about whether you're doing it right or, or wrong or not, but that you, um, you abide in the vine, you ask the spirit to show you what are those practices in my classroom that um, can be formational, that you know, that are opportunities for my students to know you better in their heart. Yeah. Very cool. And we have a, a question that has come through. It's a bit more of a course practical question. Uh, is what are the methods you can specialise in at Eastern, which is a really good question. So they're a little bit different when looking at either the primary or the secondary. So studying with us, you choose a to do a bachelor, bachelor of Education or Master of Teaching in either primary or secondary. So, uh, and in those as well, you choose different streams or a major and a minor. Uh, so we have English, Mathematics, History, Humanities, uh, and in some of the courses there's opportunity for theology or student welfare. Um, Jackie, did you wanna shape that out a little bit more or? Yeah. <laughs> I've got an eye that's doing that strange thing that it does. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, yes, so j just because the subject is not in the list, I wouldn't get that, uh, let that stop you from inquiring. Um, sometimes we can actually make arrangements. Yeah. 
and I'm just going to cry out of my right eye. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And that is a really great point to make. Um, we do have students that in the past have maybe done majority of their units with us, but have uh, done maybe like a music minor or another area at another college and have that transferred as cross institutional study with us, but done the remainder of their course with us. So it's a really great point uh, and option as well. Uh, here we go. So another, uh, probably our last question. Uh, someone is beginning to uh, studying to be a Mandarin teacher at a secular school. Uh, do you have any other examples of how to teach Christianly as a language teacher? It's a specific one. Yeah. Um, there's a beautiful book um, by David Smith and another lady. Uh, I think her name is Barbara, called Learning from the Stranger. And they have, they, it is full of ideas. Um, language learning is not, <laughs> is not my area. So nothing is springing to mind immediately. But um, I, can, I can look this up and get back to you. I, because David Smith is a um, language learner and he's got lots of examples, um, that's one of those things that, if, you know, if I get your contact details, I can, I can send something through. Awesome. Thanks, Jackie, uh, for being willing to do that. And that kind of wraps up our time this evening. So thank you again, uh, Jackie, for sharing those insights with us. And thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. Uh, if you have questions that you didn't put in or weren't answered, uh, or maybe you're interested in chatting about study options with us for 2021, uh, we'd be delighted to have a chat with you one-on-one -on -one and discuss your specific uh, course options. So uh, please click uh, we'll pop a link in the chat. You can just click on that and, and book an appointment. We'd love to have a chat with you as well. Uh, if you're interested in studying with us uh, and missed this morning our intro to study at MSV in Easton, we're having another one on Friday morning. So uh, pop that in your calendar. We'll be going through all the practicals of um, the college, application processes, fees, courses available. Uh, so if you're interested in joining us for that, please do so as well. Uh, there's also a number of other webinars happening throughout the rest of the week. So please head to the open day uh, page on the website to view the schedule. Uh, we're so glad that you were able to join us today and we hope you have a lovely evening. God bless you.